going to be a private trip with our favorite guide. He grew up in Chicago, was very active um, as a teenager and, and young child there actually, I think, and has done a lot of work now um, with his birding company, but also with the uh, children and, and young adults and teens in the Chicago area. I think he was like the um, birder of the year or, or young adult birder of the year at one time. So anyway, this was the trip and why Namibia? Well, he loved it. Our daughter who lived in Swaziland um, said, you've got to go to Namibia. And if you're there, you've got to go to Chobe National Park in Botswana. So with that, we set off. Oop, let's see. Ah, okay. So a little bit about Namibia. Well, our trip started in Windhoek, which was a capital. And then you can see that we went down south. This was not on a really birding route, but it's if you're a photographer, that's where you go because of the spectacular scenery there. We then came up along the coast to the main port area, which was um, Walvis Bay and then um, uh, Swakopmund going then to Erongo and then of course to the famous park, a park uh, Itosha National Park, and then over onto this strip area. Now it is a rather funny shape for Namibia. I'm going to give you a little bit of the history here. Um, the British, I think were in the area first and said, oh my gosh, this is a godforsaken land. It looks so dry and awful, but there's one place for a good port and that's Walvis Bay. And that's where you see where we stayed, Alamere Hotel. So they were always in control of Walvis Bay. The Germans came in a little bit later and said, oh, well, we'll take this land. And they did. But what happened in the 1870s, uh, there was a meeting of all the um, colonial powers in Africa, it didn't include any Africans, of course. And Germany at that time said, you know, we really wanna be closer to some of our holdings on the Eastern part of Africa. And we wanna be able to use the Zambezi River to get our products out to market. So England, you owned, it wasn't called Botswana then, it was like Bekwana land. You know, would you be willing to give us a little bit of this? So they said, okay, we'll do that. And we'll take Zanzibar from you. So this little strip up here, is called the Caprivi Strip, named after the German diplomat who um, negotiated the deal. It's only about 30 or 40 miles wide. Unfortunately, um, during the civil war in Angola, it was virtually a no man's land, but now it, it's perfectly safe. So we had no trouble there. Um, after World War I, Namibia, well, it was Southwest Africa, was ruled from South Africa. And following World War II, South Africa really wanted to annex the whole thing, but the UN said, no, I don't think you better do that. In 1990, Namibia became independent, but it was not until 1993 or 94 that Walvis Bay actually became part of Namibia. Compared to other African countries, they've been ruled quite well. They don't have a lot of the problems. They do have extreme poverty and wealth, but, um, Everybody seems to get along. The government has been running very well. So it's really a very nice place to visit. This is Windhoek. And if you've been to Africa at all, and if you've been to places like Nairobi or Cape Town, you know that they're just a hubbub and you know people everywhere, cars everywhere. Windhoek is just a very gorgeous town set. You can see in, it's in a valley. You can see the hills in the background. And um, it has a lot of the German architecture dating from the late 1800s, early 1900s. We visited the famous church there built in 1906. And the young woman who gave us the little tour, it had been modernized on the inside. She said, oh, she said, here we get along with everybody and we celebrate everybody's holidays. And you really had the feel that it was a very nice place to be. Well, of course, when you're in a new place, where do you go first? You go to the sewage ponds. And there, riding around on the aerators, were many of these wattled starlings. We also saw beautiful Mariko sunbirds. Now, feast your eyes on this because you're not going to see a lot of color in birds in Namibia because Namibia is a desert for the most part. I did ask Josh, I said, if you were going to Africa, South Africa for the first time, where would you go first? And he said, well, 
South Africa with the game parks and Kruger and whatever, but Namibia really is special. Okay, so then we set out going down to Susasvlei. There aren't many paved roads in Namibia, so maybe it was about 30 or four miles, uh, 40 miles out of Windhoek that we turned to gravel and dust and dirt. This road does bend here. Um, a lot of the roads in Namibia are very straight. This was what we traveled in for, it was about two, two and a half weeks. And you can see the, the desert dunes in the back. Okay, I, I don't know if you have me up on the picture. This is a camel thorn tree and there are sociable weavers that like to nest communally. So they will nest like this on a limb. Sometimes the nest gets so heavy that they will break the limb off. And this is, I guess, a thorn. It's very nice, it has a nice rattle from the camel thorn tree. I think this is a newer nest. I think it's a dove up above there. But these are the little sociable weavers that make those nests. And you can see how well they blend in with the ground. There were a lot of windmills, which surprised me in Namibia. It reminded me of my growing up in Wisconsin. And Josh said he had a, a client who was very interested in windmills. And when they went over to check the equipment, a lot of it had been made in the Midwest, of course. And this is where you store the oh, water. and my husband here, the engineer said those tanks there on the left are where they store the water. Okay, so we had stopped for lunch and you can see it's a rather forbidding landscape here. We are up on the escarpment and now we're looking down toward the Atlantic coast in the west. Um, Josh said, this is where we should find the Herrero chat. And I'm singing Herrero chat here in this. Well, there were some scrubby bushes across the road, but we had our lunch and then continued on. And 200 feet down the road, what did we see? A pair of Herrero chats. Warren could have reached out of his window and actually petted one if he wanted to. Um, interesting here, Herrero um, is the name of a tribe that was virtually decimated by the Germans. And when I did this talk for our bird club last year, I had read an article just then in the New York Times saying that, well, Germany has come to terms with the Holocaust. They have not come to terms with what happened in Africa. And talks were going on at that time between representatives from Namibia and the Germans to see how they could make reparations, so to speak. This is a bird, as I say, it was very easy for us to find, but Josh said he had spent one afternoon outside of Walvis Bay with clients just looking for this very bird. Well, this was our first mammal that we encountered. And this is very special because where we stayed, they had come across a Hartman's mountain zebra. It was a, a baby. And apparently the mother had left it at the side of the road because they were suffering a terrible drought. In fact, in Windhoek, we were told to save our shower water when we were heating the water up so that they could use it to water their plants. So apparently the mother had abandoned this little thing because she couldn't care for it and it was just too dry. Now, this is not the zebras that we're going to see later on. Hartman's mountain zebra, if you'll notice, it has the striping all the way down the legs. And notice on the white stripes here, well, he looks a little dirty. He's about five weeks old, we were told. Um, there's no shadow stripe in between. Now, these zebras like to be on slopes or higher up and ridges, and they do need to have water once a day, but they're not down in the plains area. Well, here we are. It looks like it's the middle of the night, and it certainly felt like it. Of course, this was winter time there, so it was about this was about 6.30 in the morning. That's the moon in the background. It was freezing cold. It would be very cold in the early mornings and then it would warm up into the low 80s with no humidity by midday. So here we are because you cannot enter Susasvlei until sunrise. So that was like at 6.54. So at 6.54, we could go in. However, we were number 46 in line, so we did have to wait for a while, and as I say, it was freezing cold. I was back in the vehicle very soon. Okay, well, forget what I said here about 
unpaved roads. If you did not have a paved road here, this would be one dust valley. It would be just awful. You wouldn't be able to see anything. And you really do want to see things because you have these gorgeous dunes. These are among the highest sand dunes in the world. These do not move. What? And this is my favorite photo of the trip. Oh, I have to let my husband speak <clears throat> once in a while. So anyway, these dunes basically do not move because they have a, a strong base underneath. And it's just a little bit on the top where they will uh, blow. Well, this is dead flay. Now in this area, there's a subsurface river and there are other, a vlay is a valley. So there are other vlays in this area which will get water in them. But this one is dead vlay for a reason because the dunes have cut it off. It will never get water. Some of the trees, the dead trees that you're looking at here are four or 500 years old. This is a clay basin, unlike what we're going to see later on. Now there's a dune over on the left side here, which you don't see in the picture, but that was the one our daughter climbed up and they have a trail that goes up there. A lot of the, the kids and young adults, and I think even adults had brought their plastic sleds. So they were sledding down the sand dune. Well, it was time to continue on. And I just can't describe how beautiful the scenery was, you know, when you're coming in at sunrise and the color, it's the iron oxide that gives these dunes the orange color. And it was just spectacular as you were riding in. You could ride in on the paved road and then at a certain point, you were on sand and you had to let, well, Josh had to let air out of the tires to make it easier to go. Well, coming out, Josh said, I can find birds anywhere. You have GPS. And he said, there should be dune marks right here. And so we were looking for the dune mark. Warren was about 10 feet away. He said, oh, they're right down here. They were the cutest little things. It was the only time I've ever put a lark on my five favorite uh, birds of our, our trip. Um, I, I literally, was afraid to look down or move my feet because they were walking right around my feet. Josh had some cracker crumbs and they would take the crumbs if he threw them out onto the sand. He did have a cracker, but they wouldn't come and take it out of his hand. You can just see how charming these little dune marks are. There aren't really endemic birds in Namibia. This is probably the closest they are. Um, not hard to find, but they are just in certain localities. So this would be the closest thing, I think, to an endemic bird. Well, now we're heading north, and I, I think we've caught this ostrich in a rather, for him, inconvenient time as he's um, attending to his toiletries, so to speak. Interesting fact about ostriches, they are wild only in Namibia and part of Western Botswana. The ones that you will see in South Africa, and I remember this where there would be big farms and they would all come over to the fence and look at us. So these are actually wild ostriches. Beautiful antelope in Namibia, oryx, um, kudu you'll see later on. And of course you could get in the restaurants, you could eat their meat because a lot of them are actually raised for sale to restaurants. This is a fascinating area. I best saw it described as worm castings, castings because Warren couldn't get a good picture, but it was like a worm casting, it, just big ones all over, just amazing. And this is a very strange area. There's a book written about this called The Sheltering Desert by Heno Martin. And what happened was this, there were two German geologists who in the um, 1930s, late 30s, early 40s were working down in Southwest Africa. They were afraid that with the war coming, they would be put in prison and they didn't wanna do this. So they set out with a packed lorry and then they put the lorry in a place under a ledge where it would be hidden and they set out and they camped in various spots for something like two and a half years until one of them got sick with, with scurvy or rickets and had to turn himself in and then he turned in his friend. But it was how they lived. I mean, they were shooting game. They had to uh, finally make their own bullets. They ran out of bullets. They, their, shoe, their leather and their shoes disappeared. They had to use animal hides. They had to change places a couple of times. They tried to grow some crops um, when they were along a, a riverbed, but sometimes it got washed out. 
So it's just an incredible story called The Sheltering Desert by Heno Martin. When they finally turned themselves in, they uh, were fined. They had taken their dog with them. They were fined because they didn't have a, a license for Otto the dog. And they had gone off without telling people where they were. So they spent a couple of nights in, in jail. And then they were allowed actually to continue their work. Well, the lappet faced vulture, if vultures can be considered to be attractive. This is probably the most attractive. It's got a wingspan of over six feet. You can see the white under the wings and the thighs, and you can even see a little bit of the red lappets. This is a bird that is found primarily in more arid regions. And it, I must say, I think it's quite lovely. Well, you can see I've got my flamingo scarf on here. We're now in Walvis Bay. And it was flamingo time. And these are all the lesser flamingos. This is a picture from the photographer here in the crowd who said, oh, we have to put this one in that I took. There were also greater flamingos there. They've got their heads down. You can see the difference in, in coloration between, mm -hmm. between the lesser in the back and the um, the greater flamingos in the front and the bills will be much lighter as well in the greater ones. This is a scene that we had. This was just a little bit north of Walvis Bay, but in Walvis Bay, all the way down, just thousands and thousands of flamingos. They don't breed here. This was, as I say, the winter and they will be going farther north. Across in a more sheltered area across the, the main drag of town, there was this little pond-like area. And so you had some of the juveniles here and you also had pied avocets. We also on the beach saw great white pelicans, which were in their breeding plumage. Heart lob skull, which is one of the less common ones there. And north of Walvis Bay is the place where the tourists go. This is Swakmund a German town, and you can see the, the tower there was the bell tower or clock tower that dated from the early 1900s. We actually went up in there and you get a very nice view of town. This is where they have the restaurants, where they have the souvenir shops. You can see that uh, on this building here, they were doing some renovation. I think at one time it had been a hotel, it had been a brothel, it had been a, a bar and whatever, but um, really doing a very nice job. And this is a place where our daughter said, oh, you have to go there. And we did. And the next day, Josh said, I have a very special treat. If we have time, we're going to go and see the Wellwitchia plant. Well, I had noticed the night before when we had our pizza dinner, they had a Wellwitchia pizza on the menu. And I thought, I don't want to try that. I don't know what it is. Well, these are fantastic plants, which are 500 to 1,000 years old. They have just two leaves. I know it looks like there are several more leaves here, but they fray apart. So it looks like more, but it's actually just two leaves. There's a whole trail here that you can take. And I think some of them rise up much higher because I've read that they have put fences around some of them. Apparently some of the kudu and oryx like to eat on them. Although <laughs> where we were, I certainly didn't see any other animals in sight. And also for tourists, because they do have a, a tourist run where you can take a tour here. So this is a close up of the uh, flowering or the fruiting part of the plant. So this was a real thrill to see this and a great surprise. Uh, Namibia is very concerned about conservation. Um, and you can see here that this is a Damara turn breeding area. Please stay out. We didn't see any breeding turns. It wasn't the right season, but you can get a feeling that they are very protective of what they have. <laughs> Josh said, we're going to pull up here and see thousands of cormorants. Well, maybe there were three way out there somewhere. We had a big truck next to us. They were doing some type of work out there on the platform. Don't know what happened, but we didn't get a good view of a cormorant. However, you can see that uh, they certainly make use of their products. Guano factory and salt. A lot of the um, materials are shipped to South Africa. They use the, the salt and the guano in agriculture and their chemical industry. Namibia also has a lot of, um, well, I think it's gold mining, diamond and precious stones. Uh, so those are some of their main products that they have. Now, continuing on our way, a bearded woodpecker. 
And this is the African hoopoo. You might wonder why Josh is holding this hoopoo. And I must say that when I've seen them on the ground, you usually don't see their crest uh, raised like that. It's only when you hold them or when they're excited about something that that will happen. Well, why is Josh holding it? It had been trapped. You can see a little bit of the fence down below and maybe you'll see it better here because then Josh released the hoopoo. He had been trapped over in what had been, a, I think the remnants of a garden where it had a fence around and then it had netting all over it. And this poor thing was you know, trying to get up and out and it couldn't do it. So that was when Josh um, went in and, and saved it. One happy hoopoo. This is the Rupel's parrot. We were at sort of a, a, was a campsite and they had cabins where you could stay. And the man, the owner there was feeding the birds. We waited long enough to see Rupel's parrot come in and you can see that they are not very brightly colored. We couldn't even get a good picture of the tail because either they were in the trees or hanging on the feeders in a way such that you couldn't really see much, but very glad to see it. Now, this is geologically speaking, one of the most interesting parts of Namibia. At one time, there was um, a volcano in this area and the hot spot has now moved out into the Atlantic Ocean. This is Irongo, and Irongo means big mountain. There were many magna chambers uh, around the, the volcano. And so even though the hotspot moved out, there are these mountains in the area and they've also been covered with sediment. So you can see fascinating uh, types of, of structures here. We stayed in a tent, it was a beautiful tent. I mean, it had a shower area in it. Um, big beds, beautiful. Again, they were having a water shortage here. We had to save our shower water and take short showers. We were told that two years earlier, I think it was by November, all of their boreholes were dry and they had to go into town some 10 miles away to get water. A lot of little rock hyrax, which were running outside our, our tented area. The very common African red-eyed bulbul, this was setting out early in the morning and you can see the, uh, the rock structure in the back here. They call these copies and you see a lot of um, rock structures like that in, in various parts of Africa and certainly here. These are the white browed sparrow weavers and unlike the sociable weavers, they make rather attractive nests and they nest together but not the way the sociable weavers do. Very pleased to see the rock runner. This is another bird that's sort of endemic to the region, if not to Namibia itself. Now we took an afternoon ride there. And of course, me of little faith, we wanted to see the Hartlob spur fowl. And it was getting late in the day. And I'm telling you, this was one of the roughest rides we ever took. And all of a sudden they came in flying overhead and landed, this is actually up on a ridge, but we had very good views both with binoculars and then Josh um, with the, the um, equipment that he had. So you see the male over there on the left and then the female on the right. This is one of those birds you really do wanna see. It was very near an area where they had rock art and supposedly you could get out and then go and see the rock art. Well, it was by that time 4.30 in the afternoon and you started out going through bushes. There did not seem to be a trail. It looked like it would take 45 minutes or so to get there. So we didn't do that and most people didn't do that. Now, take a good look at this bird. It's a pretty good sized bird, the red crested Korhan, very attractive. And we're going to encounter something about that later on. They have several hornbills in this part of uh, Africa and Namibia. This is one of the less common ones, the Montero's hornbill. And of course, the helmeted guinea fowl. What is Africa without guinea fowl? but you really wanted to see the rosy-faced lovebirds. This is early in the morning. Oh, they were so cute. And they were even more attractive from the backside. This is, we were up and we had to walk up to sort of the 
top side of a, a little hill here. And the staff would throw out feed in the morning. So you see the various birds. You see the lovebirds. You see the red-billed Franklin coming in. You see the guinea fowl up here. You see pale winged starlings. There were some African red-eyed bulbuls somewhere. There were some little um, bassy rats coming in. Um, there were some doves way in the background. It was, it was fascinating. And so what I want to do is give you a feel of the morning sunrise, the dawn chorus. From the rocks in the background there, we did have peregrine falcons. Any fowl coming in, lovebirds flying to the tree that they like, some of the doves up on the hillside. Was a tree the lovers like the perch when they were Well, now we're in Etosha National Park, the famous park there. Etosha means Great White Plain. Our first big mammal that we encountered was the black rhino. And we're not quite sure what that coloration was on the back part there up high. We thought maybe he'd been in the water, but it looked sort of odd. We saw him the next day and he had the same marking. So we never did figure that out. Now, interestingly, I asked Josh, I said, do you think they're cutting off the horns to prevent poaching? And he said, oh, I don't think so, not in a national park. We met a family uh, later on on our trip and they said, oh, you know what we saw? We saw a helicopter overhead and they um, sedated a rhino and then they came down and they cut off the horn and made sure he was okay. And then they flew off again. So obviously they're very concerned about poaching and doing whatever they can, whatever it takes to protect the animals. Now, because it was tourist season, we could not stay in the park. We were about at a, um, it used to be a ranch and now it's a game preserve about 10 miles outside of the park. This is the best view I have ever had of a meerkat. And this is little Cameron meerkat. What happened was there was a family of meerkats that were around the lodge. And when they started nipping at the client's toes, well, then they had to be removed. But Cameron was very nice and she didn't do that. So they let her stay. And she's now doing what adult female meerkats do and that is taking care of the young banded mongooses because they were still running around in the lodge area. And apparently it was a, a very good relationship. Now, the pale chanting goshawk is another bird that's found primarily in more arid regions. It will sit up on telephone poles, treetops, bush tops. It will go down and hunt small birds, lizards, small rodents. It can also run something like um, 200 meters along the ground and it will take down, remember that red crested corhan? It will take down a corhan. And whereas it will bring smaller prey back up to the, the perch, it cannot do that with the corhan. So it will just dive into it down on the ground. In Etosha, you have many watering holes, some of which are natural, and some of which are man-made. And of course you have the impala, you have the kudu, you have the small birds that come around um, early in the morning. Now, remember the zebra? Remember what we had with the Hartman's Mountain Zebra? See how they don't have stripes on their legs that go all the way down. And if you look closely, you can see in the white stripes is what's called a shadow stripe, which the Hartman's Mountain Zebra do not have. So this is the, the zebra that's more commonly seen in Africa. 
a very nice kudu. I always liked the Cory Bustards uh, ever since I saw one in South Africa that was displaying. I just think they're a magnificent bird. And I think Bustards as a whole are having problems because the Arabs like to capture them and then use them in their hunts. Down below, you'll see the Birchall sand grouse down here. They are watering their breasts and then they will take the water back. I don't know that it was breeding, breeding season, but they will take it back to if they have any young in the nest. Interesting, I thought, who's this Birchall? Because we're going to run into Birchall again. He was a, uh, an English, well, he started out to be a uh, shopkeeper on St. Helena and when his bride-to-be came over separately and fell in love with the ship's captain, he decided he better leave. So he came down here to South Africa and he collected plants, was quite a, a naturalist, sent a lot of them back to Kew Gardens. Um, so there are several things named after him, both I think plants and birds. A close up again of the Cory Bustard. Here's the Birchall sand grouse. Oh, the black faced wax bill. Can't quite see the bill, he's enjoying life. Now, <clears throat> beautiful elephant, but what I really want you to see is right in front. It was the first time I had ever seen an African wildcat. There are four subspecies. This of course is where your domestic cat came from. Although I'm told that the subspecies that is in Egypt is the one that's really the um, progenitor of our cats. But what it was doing, it was trying to catch the doves who were coming down for water. Oops, it's not advancing. Let's see what, oh, maybe if we do this, okay. Now we're okay. So you can see it was having trouble here and we must have watched for about 20 minutes, never had any luck. The story is when you're a small predator, it's very hard to catch anything and you're also prey for the bigger animals. Now, these are the giraffes and this is the salt flat that is in Etosha. Remember it was clay flats down in Sousa Splay. Here, the Great White Plain is a salt flat. Interestingly, at one time, millions and billions of years ago, this area was glaciated. And then when that passed and it became more tropical, this was a big lake. In fact, it was part of the Okavango uh, River system, which has now moved over to the east. Well, what happened was the lake, the water coming in and the water leaving to the coast, the um, entrance and exits were sealed off. And so the lake, which was bigger than Lake Victoria in Africa, uh, suffered from evaporation. And so now you just have the salt plain, but in uh, the wet season, it will get water in. And some of the flamingos that we saw down in Walvis Bay will come up and nest here or continue farther to the north. Another of the hornbills that are less common in the area and the gorgeous violet-eared waxbills. These are reeds. They use reeds for thatching. We were seeing people cutting them along um, the riverbanks and sometimes in the fields. They are very expensive. And so when we stayed at this lodge, which I think was getting a bit run down and probably will be replaced by a new gorgeous place. Anyway, Mark, the owner said it was too expensive to put the thatch up. And so he's now covering his cabins and house with tarps. This was a very interesting place. Um, Mark had been a ranger in Etosha for a long time. And so here they took care of a lot of the wildlife. Their chickens that they raised were having problems with the genet cat. So the chickens came in at nighttime. So we would be eating dinner and then up, I think it was over on the, up in the shelf here, there was a basket, one chicken was there. Some chickens were down in the bowl here. So it, it was quite an interesting dinner. And then Bucky, Bucky was the goat that was supposed to be a Thanksgiving dinner years and years ago. Bucky was now 14 and had a little problem with incontinence. So had to stay outside, but he would put his head in the window. And then at nighttime, he would come in and sleep inside. Now, note the boo-boo here. Note the coloring, note how white it is because we're going to see another one later on. This is a swamp boo-boo. This is on the property and Mark was running the hose that day. So a lot of birds were coming in for the water. Gorgeous violet-backed starling, you know, 
our starlings aren't so ugly either. They're just a bird out of place, but these were really spectacular. Then of course you took the cruise because here we were on the Okavango River. This is the Nile crocodile. The water always looks so inviting and then you don't want to ever put your hand in. You might also see a hippo. Did you know that hippos are the most dangerous animals in Africa? Um, you don't want to get mixed up with one. They will fight. In fact, at the end of our trip, we did see there had been a fight and one of the hippos had died. And so it was half on the bank, half out with its feet in the air, smelled awful. There must have been a dozen Nile crocodiles around. They are also very protective of their young. And so you don't want to get anywhere near them. Um, this was where we had stopped for our sundowner. You know, you stop and you have your beverage and you have your little nuts or chips or whatever. So while Josh and Mark were setting up things, Warren said, oh, our boat's drifting away. Fortunately, Josh had to go in only to mid-calf to get the boat before it got farther out into the Okavango. Now, away from the river, this is a type of vegetation that you'll see. We're now in the northern part of Namibia. You'll see it's much um, more brushy, scrubbier, and you really have uh, respect for the uh, people who lived in these areas because I thought I would get lost right away. There were some power lines. And when I looked at the power lines, I could try to figure out where I was, but it was no easy task. Now we are down a little farther on the Okavango River. This is the fish eagle. There were many of them there. It's related to our bald eagle. We would wake up in the morning. We had the, the last cottage um, in the row and we would hear this, go, 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 go in the morning. And they were the fish eagles calling. We were taking a morning cruise this time and had these nice giant kingfishers that were nesting in the bank. This is a type of uh, boats that they used. It uh, looks like a dugout and they would be cutting reeds from the side, they'd get off. And they also would have where you had villages near the water, they might have an area where you could come down and you'd have people washing dishes or you know, bathing in the river. I'm sure they lost a few to crocodiles or whatever each year. White fronted bee eaters were nesting here and this was a close up of one of them. Hammer cop, we had one right outside our room. We had a marshy area. They're such a funny looking bird. These were adorable, the wire-tailed swallows. First time I really ever got a good look at a wire tail. Oh, just so appealing. And then on sandbank in the river, there was the sacred ibis and of course the African skimmers, the Goliath heron, which is the largest heron in the world, flying off here, as are the African skimmers. Again, the African fish eagle, they uh, will take the fish with their talons. And if it's small enough, like a, a pound or two, they will carry it up to a perch. But if it's bigger, they sort of lop along the water and then take it to the bank. We did have the wattled lapwing moving away from us. But what we really came to see was Pell's fishing owl. This is the iconic bird of the Okavango and it's just, the eyes are just mesmerizing like those lumps of coal. Unlike other owls, they do not have the feathers and the wings so that they fly quietly at nighttime because they are perched over the river, either on a, a stump or a, a tree branch or something and then they're catching fish from the river. So they don't need to fly quietly through the trees. They, they are very hard to see because in the daytime, they are up in these trees with you know, a lot of greenery. You have to know exactly where they are. And of course we had a guide who knew where there were several. We just had the one come for us. What a treat. Back at our uh, Shikawe Lodge was the Crested Barbet. And in the fruiting or the uh, flowering tree there, the black-headed black <laughs> oriole. This was a real treat to see. This is not Josh's picture. This I must say is off the internet, the great bittern because on our last morning there, I looked up and said, oh, Josh, it looks like some herons or egrets flying overhead. Oh, I think they're um, black crowned night herons. Oh no, I think they're great bitterns. I've never seen a great bittern before. So he was shooting with his camera and of course nothing where you could see anything close up. But when he went back and looked at the pictures and then came to breakfast, he said, 
They were great bitterns. And of course it was a life bird for him and for us as well. Um, in the north here, you did find more little villages. It was hard to see into the villages because they were surrounded either by stucco walls and they were like stucco buildings or you might have reeds around them and little reed uh, type um, enclosures or homes. They did have stands out along the highway where you could buy, for instance, your meat if you so chose to do that. We also, when we got to larger towns, saw school children walking along the road. Um, Charlie, uh, back at uh, the lodge there, um, at, uh, well, who was making dinner for us that one time, she was saying that education is very good up through about sixth grade, then it starts to fall off in junior high and then in high school because the kids usually have to go away from their village and either stay with relatives or find a place to stay. So that is a problem. Well, we're now along the Zambezi River. We're in the Caprivi Strip and one of the attractive birds there is the Shallows Turaco. They're always, I mean, Turacos are gorgeous birds in Africa. Down along the Zambezi was the little white browed robin chat. And there were several of these at our last stop in Kasane in Botswana. I should say that in the Okavango, when we were down in some of those lodges where uh, we saw the, the Pell's fishing now, that was in Botswana. We were sort of back and forth here. Um, it looked like a nice lawn. We have our back to the Chobe River. And if you were to look down to the river, you would see a lot of grassy area. You would see these little warthogs during the daytime. Well, they weren't so little, but little compared to the hippo, which we saw when we were eating dinner one night, everybody said, oh, come quickly, you have to see the hippo that's out in this area. We went in the daytime, in the morning, we drove into Chobe National Park and we saw the baboons, impala, the blue waxbills, which I always find very attractive until I saw the violet-eared waxbill. And interesting, what are they all doing in the tree here? It looks like Christmas ornaments, and there are also some fire finches. Well, they had been on the ground a minute before, but all of a sudden there was a pearl spotted owlet, a very ferocious but tiny predator. It also has eye spots in the back of the head, presumably to confuse predators who would be after it. The brown hooded kingfisher, now, remember that boo-boo that we saw before, the swamp boo-boo up here? Notice how it's got apricot coloring. So this is the tropical boo-boo and not the swamp boo-boo. Virtual starlings, arrow marked babblers. We saw a couple different kinds of babblers. The vervet monkey, this was interesting because there was one place you could stop and get out of your vehicle because that's where the restrooms were and they also had some picnic tables. So we were having our breakfast, a um, big van came along and the people said, you better eat up quickly because the vervet monkeys are coming and they'll steal all your food. Well, we ate up quickly. Now this was interesting. Of course, giraffes are giraffes. And I think that the younger one may be on the left and may be challenging the older, bigger one. And I think you'll even be able to hear something here. In addition to my voice sometimes, or camera clicking. Oh, and great. So now when I have video, they're just standing around. Again, 
We'd seen them nuzzling each other in the past in other parks, but never a display like this. And I don't think Josh had either. Now we're on our last afternoon on our, our trip. This was the African darter, darter. And again, Josh had never seen a bird like this with air conditioning in its wings. The red lechwe, another type of uh, less common antelope in the area. And I was thrilled to see a spotted necked otter pop up and even sit out on the ground for us for a short time. Then we started to see on our last afternoon here, some of the more common birds, the gray heron, the squacko heron, the African jacana, the hippo that got stuck in sort of the, the muddy pool there and had it finally got out. It was having great difficulty. This gorgeous malachite kingfisher that was just again an arm's length away from the boat and just sat there. Pied kingfisher, the Nile monitor lizard, the white yellow-billed stork that we saw finally get something to eat. And of course we had wondered on our morning ride into Chobe, where are all the elephants? Well, we did see some, but they go over to some of these small islands to eat the grasses. And then it's just a short distance over to the mainland and it's not very deep water. Um, last year when I was giving this presentation, there was a big uproar because Botswana was killing some of these elephants. And of course here people said, how can you do this? Well, Charlie told us, she said, you know, there are too many elephants for the carrying capacity of the land. She said something has to be done because they're going into neighboring villages, destroying crops, injuring people, killing people. So what do you do? When Stephanie was in South Africa and Swaziland, Kruger National Park was having the same problem with elephants. What do you do with all the elephants? You don't want to kill them, but where do you put them? So this was our last view our sunset on our African trip with the big males coming over last. Okay, if there are any questions. Oops. Wow. Diane, at this point, I don't see any questions in the chat. Does anybody have any questions for Warren or Diane? You can um, unmute yourself and ask, or you can type it in the chat. Just click. Click on this. Yeah. Well, okay. no. get mail. See if I can get rid of my mail here. No. Let's see if I can move it. We have a comment. Thank you, awesome program. Beautiful birds, great presentation. One question for you, is there a sense of conservation among the population? I think that there is. You know, we didn't really talk to some of the native people, but um, from a friend who's lived there and from my reading, they have a lot of these communities and they are sort of conservation communities which are very um, protective of the wildlife there that's important and very concerned about doing the best thing. So I would have to say yes. And the national parks. Well, and the national they're, parks they're, too. They're but... trying to develop more national parks in an attempt to help protect animals that way. Maybe if I click here. No, it's okay. Well. Well, sorry, I can't get rid of my email screen here. Um, they, I think there's a corridor planned across that northern section, you know, from Kruger and going through Zambia and then into um, Namibia, where the wildlife can roam freely such that you don't have them confined to just one park. So I know that that is in the works. Thank you. Another question. Did you ever feel un unsafe? Not at all. Never felt unsafe. And actually talking to someone at my farmer's market whose parents had gone there and she said they had just camped on their own and just went around and found where you could camp. No problem at all. 
I think compared to other African countries, it's probably very safe. I think we can end sharing. Should I sh stop share and see what happens here? <laughs> I think people can end. Oh yeah, then I get rid of my... <laughs> right. Well, any other questions from Amy Millie Maggie says beautiful pictures. Thank you for presenting. So glad I watched. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yes, thanks. It was they were beautiful birds. Well, only wish we could have done this in person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is tourism a, a, a major part of their economy then in Namibia? Yes, it is. And as I say, um, not only for birding and certainly for Sousa's way, because we met people when we were Windhoek who were photographers and were going specifically down to Sousa's way for the, the lighting and the photography there. There's also um, geology tours at the end of our, well, it was in Atosha, which I'd had it earlier, a book on geology uh, written by a woman who's there who leads geology tours, because I say it's just a fascinating area for geology. More comments. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you for the experience. Any other questions out there? How about you, Dottie? Any questions? No, you covered it beautifully. Those pictures of the colorful birds, fabulous. Or even the dull birds, how about that? <laughs> So where is Josh's next tour? Um, you know, he's got some plan. In fact, I just heard from him the other day. Uh, he is in Chicago. He's been doing a lot of day trips. He also does trips in the US. I mean, he does out to the Tetons and Yellowstone and down to Big Bend and wherever. Um, he has things I think scheduled for South Africa and other places, but he wasn't sure how many people would be willing to go with COVID still mm -hmm. present. So I would check out his website, you know, just Red Hill Birdie. He's just great. I mean, he's so much fun. It, not only is he extremely knowledgeable, but he's just a fun person to be with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you are such a fun speaker. You're just so enjoyable. That's and I love right. your little, kind of your little offhand jokes. <laughs> <laughs> You mean telling my husband to shut up? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> oh, he's used to that from me. That's real <laughs> to see Welwitchia, to know that it's still existing. It's such a rare endemic. Us botanists really don't know where to place it. Um, we kind of lump it in with other conifers. It does not have flowers. It's um, uh, a naked seeded plant like our other gymnosperms. But it doesn't have any uh, relatives, ancestors. Nothing seems to evolve from it. It's a very strange plant, and uh, it's been, been very heavily overcollected. So to see oh. it still existing, um, you know, I've, I've talked about it. I know about it, but to, you've actually seen it. That would be a thrill to actually get that close to see such an uh, unusual plant. That was Go to Namibia. <laughs> That was the first thing he said. I wonder if they're going to see, what is it? Well, which, yeah. Well, which, yeah. <laughs> there it was. He was thrilled. <laughs> I, I do wonder what they put on the well, which, yeah, pizza. <laughs> no. Which I wasn't brave enough to try. <laughs> oh, so they're, do they actually grow it or? No, no. no I think no. it was just named after the plant. Oh, well, I don't know if they grow it somewhere. But these were, you know, you had the trail out in the desert that um, I guess you could take a tour around and Josh knew where the end of it was so we could see some of it before we continued on. Yeah, that was cool. That was cool. Thank you ever so much. Okay, well, thank you too. And uh, we'll let you have your meeting or finish it. Right. I have, I have another comment from Stephanie Martin. 
I think you know her. Oh, hi. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Having done this very trip myself, I enjoyed the excellent wisdom from my wonderful parents. Oh, wow. <laughs> very nice. It was yeah. fun to meet you. Thank you for presenting tonight. Okay. okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Love Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night, everybody. I did record right. this, and I'll try to figure out how to get it to uh, Randy so it can get on the website sometime. Oh, that'd be wonderful. It was oh. beautiful. Oh, wonderful. Oh, thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, uh, Diane, can I ask uh, how much it, it will cost a trip like that? <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't remember whether it was like 7000 or 6000 um, yeah, per person, and you could go on Josh's, if you just look up Red Hill Birding and some of his trips, um, he'll have, I think, the cost listed there. Okay. Surprisingly, <laughs> you know, when some of these people take safaris uh, with whether it's National Geographic or Smithsonian or some of these other groups, they're more expensive than birding trips, which always surprises me, maybe because sometimes we're staying in places that are rather... <laughs> <laughs> and also this was a private trip just the oh. one guide and the two right i mean clients oh. so oh. it was supposed to have been larger it's supposed to have been six of us but but well, the, the others, others backed, backed out, out. <laughs> and so he said well let's go okay and we said yes and we paid a little extra to him because of the fact that there were just the three of us. And so it was really wonderful. I think we've been with him almost since he started birding. It was back in South Africa, back around 2008 or before um, that we had him, been with him to Madagascar and Bhutan. And wow. That's... Well, I'll get a hold of him. Yes. 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 <laughs> As I say, he does things out of Chicago, does things out west there. So um, just look him up. Will do. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. It was awesome program. Okay. Good <laughs> thank night. You. Thank you. If there is another question. I don't know if you saw or not. Did you see much of the presence of US money used for conservation purposes? No, I can't say that we did, but then you know, maybe Josh would know more about that than we would. Um, so it would be hard to tell. Um, How about these water holes that, you know, would normally go dry. And so they now have pumps to dig deeper into the ground to find the water for the animals. So whether that's funded from internally or US, I think it's internal to the, the country. Mm. Right. Good. Yeah. OK, very huh? good. Thanks yeah. once again. <laughs> OK. Bye. Goodbye. Maybe we'll have you in person in the future. Oh, that would be <laughs> great. what your next trip is. No, we yeah. love it out there. <laughs> well, we did Cuba just oh, yeah, during that's right. the start of the pandemic. <laughs> Got our trip cut a day short. We had to come home on March 17th instead of March 18th last year. <laughs> work, work on that presentation and we'll get this <laughs> slated in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you and thank you, John. You're yes, welcome. Thanks, John. everybody. Thank you, your help. Okay, bye. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.